I think this is a really good thing because what we're going to see is we're going to see China opening up in 2023. And again, I think it's very optimistic. I'm very optimistic for China. I think this was the right decision. I think China in the end, they're going to win big from this because they're certainly going to have some deaths. They're going to certainly going to have some difficult times. This is going to be short-term pain for long-term gain, what I predict in the future for 2023. But that's basically all I had to say for today's live stream. And Alex, thank you for waiting. I'm going to bring Alex into the stream here. He's been very patient here. Alex, how's the Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having me on the program. Uh, let's do a bit of a sound check. Am I okay? You guys hear me all right? That would be great. I can, I can, hear, I can hear you good, Alex. So Fantastic. What I, what I, um, yeah, I want to know what, like, you're on the ground in Chongqing. So tell me, like, what has it been? Because I remember when you, you, you know, you messaged me like three weeks ago. You're like, man, like a light switch. Overnight, testing booths gone, QR code gone. Give us every, give us, what's the last three, four weeks been like for you? Well, currently, uh, I just arrived back from Chengdu a few hours ago by train. Now, that was a completely different experience from 18 months ago, even from eight months ago or even eight weeks ago. Um, all the testing booths, all the pandemic COVID measures have been pretty much eliminated. And it's quite a surreal feeling when you go to these train stations. These are big train stations that uh, accommodate a lot of people. Just to give you an example, the Twin Cities here, Chengdu, Chongqing, there's 110 uh, bullet trains that are going back and forth daily. Now, if you go back a few months ago, you would find that the uh, attempt to get to the train station was you know, a bit difficult because then you'd be in a line to get a COVID test or uh, follow extra measures. Now, we were quite accustomed and quite used to that. Um, you know, being tested, having a COVID test almost daily was a normal thing here. Um, and traveling, you would see, okay, extra lineups and you'd be prepared for it. But now, uh, as of last week, uh, when uh, my wife and I traveled to Chengdu, you're waiting for these either extra COVID measures to be there. And they weren't. So you're looking at certain doors, whether it's shopping malls right. or restaurants or metro lines, thinking that, are they open? Is the mall open? Shouldn't there be a big booth with a big QR code that you can scan? Um, and all that, all those things were taken away. So now it's added more time onto everyone's day. People aren't waiting, queuing up, waiting to get their mobile phones ready to show that green code. Uh, you know, what big data was very effective. It, it, it was working. Um, right. But now all those have disappeared. So that traditional travel, and I just said to my wife a few hours ago, can you feel it? I can definitely feel it. Yeah. And you can feel now this was the first time where we had traveled in China in, you know, on, for me, I mean, without any COVID or pandemic measures in place. Now, people are still wearing masks. Mm -hmm. You know, they are still understanding the, you know, social distancing. Yeah, I do hear more people coughing. Uh, it is quite right. common. Um, but I did want to bring up a couple of things that, yeah. uh, you know, I was backstage watching your program. Um, there is some data that I think is important here um, because everyone's always trying to get the Chinese version of the numbers. Everyone says, right. oh, are they the real numbers? Are they the fake numbers? Or how can we trust the numbers? Well, here's an interesting institute in uh, Washington uh, State, in Seattle. It's called the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. Uh, okay. They're an institute for health metrics and evaluation is a research institute working in the area of global health statistics and impact evaluations at the University of Washington. Now, this is for the people that don't want to trust the Chinese data. They are even reporting, and this is their estimate, um, through the peak of all of this, they're coming up with their based and their current projection and I'm just going to give a death figure out here. They're predicting 293,127. Now, that is a Western prediction right. on the amount of deaths. Another note that I wanted to tell the viewers today is on an average day, 27,000 people. This is a UN report has um, quoted this number. 27,000 Chinese do die on a daily basis here. Pre-COVID, these are UN numbers uh, that are being quoted here. 
Um, that is the United Nations World Population Perspective Report from 2019. This is pre-COVID. 27,765 Chinese die per day, approximately 9.8 million a year. And wonderfully, 49,000 beautiful Chinese babies are born daily. So the news that I think that people can pay attention to here is definitely that report that I will try to share a link with you later. Uh, but if people do want to uh, easily Google it, it's Institute for uh, Health Metrics and Evaluation. They are also pointing nice. out another interesting figure that uh, I'm just going to rattle these off while we're on the program here, Cyrus, is that they are really going into detail about the infected rate here. Now, we are seeing this spread quite fast. We predicted that we might have seen the peak around April. Now um, we're hearing it's around February. Uh, and that number is really starting to climb. And they're saying the infect infection fatality rate is 0 0.000207. Um, I have to say that being here for 18 months, coming from a country, Thailand, who mm -hmm. had a intense lockdown a very very intense lockdown uh lasting almost a hundred days yeah. uh almost mirroring the united kingdom who had 110 days australia 117 days of lockdown um for most part this country has been open domestically ever since um but i can tell you that living here and understanding that how they use big data contact tracing apps uh, the COVID prevention measures, um, if this would have been the Wuhan strain that was ripping through here now, we would be having a completely different conversation. Um, being in a city of 32 million, I uh, can tell you that uh, things are pretty standard here right now. Um, are there people going to fever clinics? Yep. Uh, shortage of mes medicine? We did see uh, probably in the first day or two days, even before uh, some of the cases started to rise here, people were naturally stocking up. But yeah. now um, most people in the city here, um, they post on their Weibo accounts that they've left a bag of ibuprofen tied up to a, a, a bridge if you need it. It's at this oh, location. Nice. Oh, uh, cool. There's a lot of community sharing from it. A lot, a lot of my friends, you can see they got... Uh, anybody have a fever uh, come grab this from me come grab that from me we're seeing a lot of um uh rapid antigen tests being delivered yeah. to businesses in town so for most part um it's pretty much uh what we expected here i do want to add another note to this cyrus since yeah. you have me on the show here we did hey, get uh yep Alex, fire Alex, yeah let me let me just i want to bring up one thing that i think you brought Please really do. important because you, you said for example you know we've we've often here in the west that china you know it's like three years of zero COVID, and mm. the, the interesting thing is is I, I i love the data that you said like like the uk was over 100 day lockdown uh right. australia over 100 day lockdown um, mm -hmm. You know, we've seen these strict lockdown. Now, the interesting thing with China is that the, the zero COVID policy was was actually it was not a nationwide uh, lockdown. Right. People think like the entire country of China was locked down for three years. It really was was that, you know, you had periodic lockdowns. And and I know I know people in China that are living in certain parts where for the last three years they have not had any lockdown. Right. Because mm -hmm. it's just, you know, they live in a very dense, a very uh, sparsely populated you know part of the country. They, you know, they, you know, for example, they're just in a rural village, you know, they're just, you know, and so it's like, hey, our, our lives really haven't been, nothing's really changed other than the fact that we're not mm -hmm. really traveling much, but it's not like we are, you know, been in our, our houses for three years. And I think that's important to understand is that, you know, there's been cases, right? Like we did see Shanghai that went through a hundred plus day lockdown specifically for Shanghai. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I know people that were in Suzhou, you know, just 30 minutes away that were not locked down and that were traveling about. So it's, it's very it's really important to get that dis distinction. And I think you that brought, brought it up because, I mean, for example, Australia had an incredible lockdown, you know, that was really long and very, very strict. So, yeah. you know, very, very different. So it's just important for people to understand, uh, you know, that point as well.
but go ahead. Yeah, I think that wondering. I think that's very important. You know, you bring up Australia. I, I really feel um, for the Australians that we're not even allowed back into their own country as being passport holders of of their own nation, and not said, being allowed to come back to your your own motherland is quite quite disturbing of uh, what we've seen. But um, I mean, when we're talking about cities in China here, you are correct that some cities completely went unscathed. Uh, but when you're dealing with huge cities like Chongqing, what it will start with is it will start with a district, maybe a district or a county within that uh, province or region, and they will use big data. And, you know, for most of the year where I was been here, about 18 months, uh, I would say we'd have a, maybe a two, three day uh, mini. I don't even want to use the word lockdown because measures were still in place that you could go out and do most of your daily lives. But if cases started to build the community leaders and it's quite a, quite amazing here how things work here. Put it this way. If there's a, a pothole or a hole in front of your street you call the municipality and probably within about 48 hours, it's fixed. So there's a lot of responsibility and it, it comes right, you know, from the top, then to the mayor, then to the, uh, the districts. And some of these districts do not want to have an outbreak. <laughs> and yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. They, they, sometimes they will go overboard on it and they will, uh, you know, do it a lot faster. But here's a piece of news that I think is important here. Um, this just came across the wire here a few hours ago that China is, is to reopen its borders, drop its COVID quarantine from the 8th of January uh, that, yeah. within two weeks. Uh, we are hearing that. I just want to say that speculation um, that was also mentioned in the SEMP and other various um, uh, other uh, media outlets. But that is, um, you know, I would say. There is some truth to that. Uh, how they're going to open it is another uh, story. And I think the audience needs to understand here that um, this is a country of 1.5 billion. You can't uh, just hit the go button and uh, the airlines will come back. This is going to take, uh, you know, quite a mammoth task. Uh, I still will. I would still imagine there will be some measures in place. But um, that is incredibly good news. But, you know, Cyrus, things are changing by the, you know, by the hour here. We're seeing oh, definitely. things change by the hour. Oh, definitely. Well, you know, you know, another thing I want to bring up, Alex, that, that I think uh, is really interesting is, um, you know, is, is another point that we can kind of disprove about how the West is analyzing China. One of the things that people have said in the West is that essentially China's government has kind of painted themselves into a corner and that they don't have that ability to pivot. And I, again, I think hmm. it's so amazing because what we what we see is it is a difference. I mean, I'm going to contrast this with the United States. I think it's very difficult for the United States to pivot because of our uh, the way our government is structured. Right. We have a two party state and you can see a very a great example would simply be, you know, when Joe Biden, obviously a Democrat, comes out and says, we're going to institute this policy about vaccines. You know, you go to go to the state of Florida where you have a very Republican, very, you know, very strong red wave there in, in the state of Florida where the, you know your governor Ron DeSantis will say well no we're we're not going to listen to the president at all we're going to do our thing and 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 so that's where it's difficult for the United States to kind of all get on the same page and to basically make that pivot and and you know I'm not going to say that's entirely bad because I think you know for example uh, even to, you know I was in California last week and you know, for example, I took my kids to a museum and they said, oh, you know, you need to have mandatory masks, uh, you know, for everybody over the age of uh, two. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm really surprised. Like, um, I've, I haven't haven't I haven't been anywhere in, like, you know, in Florida, like th th there's no mask requirements anywhere. But in California, you know, much, much more Democrat, um, you know, you're going to have those mask requirements. So you can kind of see how the United States is a very polarized society. It's very divided. It, it's also how our government works. That's why, you know, both the left and the right, they don't want to work with each other. They basically want to just block each other. And it's very difficult to make that forward progress, where, as you said, like you said, in, in China, you do have a one party state. It's extremely easy for them to pivot because they can they can literally flip a switch. Hey, it's zero COVID today. Hey, you know what? We're going to change this policy. But it does go from the top down. And like you said, you know, if you're a, a district manager or if you are, you know, a government official that is in charge of, hey, I, I oversee this local district, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're, you you know, your powers come from a, from a top, right? You know, it comes mm -hmm. from the top down, you know, you don't want to, uh, you know, lose face or you don't want to underperform. You do definitely want to make sure that you're, 
that you are listening and adhering to the guidelines that are given to you from abroad, from above, I should say. And we saw that in Shanghai, right? We saw when the Shanghai outbreak happened, that's what that's exactly what happened, right? The local government in Shanghai said, we're going to do things a little differently. All of a sudden, Beijing central government said, nope, we're going to overstep you. We're coming into Shanghai. We're going to lock this down. We're going to do it our way. And so you see that difference in how you know the society is. And that's basically a government di uh, difference. But I think it's remarkable because that's something that many people don't understand is that China's government does have that ability to pivot because there, you know, it's a one-party state. I mean, that's exactly what it can do. And, and when China says, hey, we are going to open up January 8th, we're going to drop that. You know, I, I think what we're seeing here, Alex, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm very bullish, you know, for China in 2023 because I know that they have to, you know, get that economy back on track. I know that, you know, they, I mean, I, mean, I was reading a report from uh, McKinsey uh, about foreign direct investment, foreign direct investment, um, increased tremendously in 2021, and they have the data for the first six months of 2022, you know, up 24% from last year. Uh, and, I mean, there's there's a tremendous amount of, as much of the anti-China sentiment we see in the West, I, I see, I always like to say this, you know, I always like to, to, to analyze what politicians say, because we know they say things based on emotion, and then I actually look at what businessmen are doing. And, you know, the businesses are doing the opposite, right? They're investing more in China. They are, um, you know, for example, uh, I'm in Las Vegas right now, and we've got the Consumer Electronics Show coming in. This, we've got a ton of Chinese companies here that are coming to Las Vegas for the largest electronics show in the world. Uh, I'm actually going to be going to that. Uh, it's going to be the first week of the new year. I'm going to be doing a lot of videos and, and kind of highlighting all these Chinese companies that are coming here because every one of them wants to do business with the U.S. And we have more trade going on between the U.S. and China in 2022 than any year in history. So as much as this kind of anti-China stuff's going on, I'm optimistic, buddy. I'm optimistic that I can hopefully be in Chongqing with you sometime in 2023. Oh, no, that would be great. I think, you know, if we we look back at some of the media reports that were uh, reported after the 20th Congress, there was also a 20 point plan about reopening the company or country. I keep calling it a company, uh, but it uh, it was very detailed. So this is no surprise on we're pivoting to this uh, uh, part in these covid measures. Now, yes, there are people that are uh catching COVID. Yes. It's yeah. uh, now, I mean, you go back three months ago, four months ago, uh, if somebody got COVID, did, they would make the news. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but right, now exactly. it's, it's now first we're going in a phase here where people were generally extremely scared about this and, you know, understanding the strains, they know all the strains, you know, they know the deltas and they know the Omicrons, they know it, if it's a BA five, it's BF seven. They are studying this, you know, uh endlessly yeah now also you know with the health professionals you got to remember that it's quite an acceptable uh understanding on how the health clinics work fever clinics and i heard you were talking about before that most people in the united states have that option to visit a clinic or visit a doctor's office but here in things in china a lot of things are done in the hospital with the hospitals i was you know viewing and uh actually visiting them to because i've been doing a report for our company um that there th these preparations were going on weeks ago preparing right. for something like this to happen it's not like they just woke up one morning and said okay uh let's roll the dice uh with one and a half billion people and see what happens even though we do want even though a lot of the western media do want this country sorry to say this but a lot of the mainstream and Western media um, do want this country to fail. Oh, they do uh, as, as, uh, as morbid and uh, sick as it is. There are a lot of uh, news channels that are reporting uh, and being very ridiculous in some of their numbers. Uh, yeah. No one holds them accountable. Unfortunately uh, yeah. we might in, next year. Uh, well, but well, uh, Alex, yes, I mean, go ahead. Just, I know. Let me just, let me just bring in these, sorry to cover your face off a little bit. I mean, I mean, again, it's just Gordon Chang is the poster boy for this. I mean, he makes a living off of hating China. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's sad because he's, he's publicly said, I mean, he's, he's ashamed of being ethnically Chinese. And as a result, he just hates on China more and more every day. It's a sad thing. I mean, he's, he's, he's half Chinese, exactly like my children. And it, and, and I get it. The guy was, he was bullied as a child and you know that that's certainly unexcusable but it's it's there's nothing wrong with being chinese i mean there's nothing wrong with being proud of china this guy but this is the thing i mean this is this is someone that wants 
China to fail tremendously. He's been calling for it for 20 plus years. I mean, but here's the thing. I mean, like you, you can never win with Gordon because I mean, here he contradicts himself saying, look, you know, the regime, I just love that word. I mean, anytime you say the regime, you know, you're, you're trying it, it, you know, it's automatically a very negative connotation, but it's like, look, I predict that they're going to, they're going to do this for another five years, because again, this is what Gordon. And again, the anti-China YouTuber that I was, you know, commenting on, on Twitter, you know, he, you know, they basically, it's all about control. It has nothing to do with health. And, and then here, all of a sudden, as soon as they change, it's like, we'll pray for China. You know, now they're defenseless, so irresponsible from China's government. So it's it's constantly this damn if you do, damn if you don't. China can never win. But the interesting thing is, is I, I, I it's amazing because, you know, they're, China's government is so systematic in what it and how it, it, you know, people people tend to think that it, they just make these decisions just out of thin air. Uh, right. I mean, it's just like, oh, they woke up one morning and they just like, ah, oh, you know, screw it. Let's just open up the country. I mean. You know that China has been analyzing a tremendous amount of data. And again, I think the criticism that you can give China is that they waited a little too long. I mean, in my opinion, I think they could have opened up earlier. Now, that's but again, that's my opinion. But again, they have made this pivot. And it's something where and, I, and I've had some people ask me, say, Cyrus, don't you think it's a little bit weird, though, that China's government has said, look, for the last you know three years, this is a deadly disease. And now it's like, OK, we're going to go ahead and open up and let it rip. And I think what you see is, is um, again, it's, it's you, you have to, your opinion of COVID needs to change with the data, right? We know the strand today is very much less mm. significant than what it was before. And you mentioned that before, right? Like if it was, yeah. if, if, if this was the strand of, I mean, if, if China, of the Wuhan strand problems. back in March 2020, it'd be a massive problem. I mean, a huge problem for China. Mm -hmm. So again, I think that's where, you know, we go back and we have to be just honest, you know, let's be honest and say, look, there was, there was definitely some success. Um, and great achievements done, even even in 2022. Like I mentioned, the Beijing 22 Olympics. I mean, fantastic event for China, fantastic event for the world. That was only made possible because of China's you know zero COVID policy that kept the athletes safe. And and then again, now we're at a point where you know China's going to pivot. They've done the data, the research. They've done the data. It's exciting because I think it's it's going to be healthy for China in the long term. One of the things that I was very um, you know, as someone that advocates for a good U.S. China relationship, I was worried for China because whenever China is cut off from the world, uh, we look back at Chinese history. That's when it's typically the weakest. Right. When China mm -hmm. didn't have these international relationships, when it's essentially China all by itself. You know, China's not stupid. They they know that they are they need the the world. You know, they 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 depend on these good relationships. I mean, China's the manufacturer of the world. It's the number one trading partner for the vast majority of the world. It's how China grows its economy, how its business, and and I think it's a good thing for China. I mean, I think we fast forward this. You know, by the summertime, I'm 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 optimistic that we're going to have daily flights back to China. People can be traveling for tourism. You know, hopefully, I'm on the streets and. In China, you know, making some really good content, you know, continuing to help build this channel and and really helping promote, uh, you know, China to the world. You know, I can I, I just want to add to to people like Gordon Chang and stuff like that. I can understand that when um, one of the greatest things in the world to ever happen to your life has um, you've you've kicked it, you've beaten it, you've abused it even though you're so in love with it, I'm talking about Gordon's probably love at one point for China where he decided to turn another direction and scream and kick and just absolutely do everything he can. There is not a person on this earth that has ever been to China that I can imagine would have that much disdain for a country like this. This country is absolutely amazing. It has given people, even Westerners that come here, the ability to expand their companies to, uh, you know, to an amazing level. Look at Tesla's investment here. Look at Apple's no. investment here. These are major, major companies. Uh, you know, a lot of the Fortune 500 companies have a presence here. So when you Absolutely. see someone like him kicking and screaming, well, I can understand uh, when uh, probably some of the greatest parts of his life he will never, ever be able to experience again because of such shame he's brought upon himself, especially when it uh, comes to humiliating himself when it comes to China. And yeah. Uh, yeah, you can only see that with people that have pretty narrow vision. It's unfortunate. Uh, I know he probably uh, wakes up in the morning and sees China in the headlines and he just goes, oh, what a great country.
but he can't say that. That's unfortunate. Yeah. It's it's it's, yeah. it's tough. Alex, I'm gonna I'm gonna end. Uh, so feel free Please. to stay on for this segment. I'm just gonna end because I, I I told the guys, I told the streamers, I said I had a really interesting comment. I want to close out this because I think it sounds good. Highlights on what Alex and I said. But this is this is interesting because many of you know I've relocated back to the United States after 15 years abroad. This is a comment that came in last night on my YouTube channel. Cyrus, since you came back home, have you encountered any bad experiences like people giving you a dirty look or a name, calling you a traitor, CPC shill? How have your relative and friends say things about you? This is a really good comment. And I want people to understand this. One of the reasons that I came back to the United States is because I'm someone that advocates a, a good relationship between the United States and China. And I came back to the United States for an important job because I was, I was living in Canada. But, you know, one is I want to come back to be closer to my family. But two, if I'm working on U.S.-China relations, I think I should be living in one of those two countries. And my reach here in America is better because what I do every single day is I connect with Americans. And I can honestly say this, answer this question. I have... I have met with so many Americans in the last six months of relocating here, and I talk to everybody about China. I'm very open. I say, you can go to my YouTube channel. I'm very proud of the work that I do. Go to Cyrus Jansen. Just type in Cyrus China. You can find all my videos on China. And what I have found is I have not found a single person that I have connected with that has had any issues with the content that I do, because what I can do is I can sit down and I can, I can rationally talk to anybody about China. And one of, one of, my, one of my friends here in, in, in um, America, he works for he's a he, he's a police officer and he works in uh, he's basically a private detective, and he 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 said you know I'm, I'm really fascinated by your channel because in the West like all we hear is negative right it's all I hear is negative about China but as a detective my my job is to examine all sides of the story so I'm I'm fascinated by this because you know for example I've never heard of the BRICS I never once heard of BRICS in my entire life you know uh, you know obviously Brazil Russia India China. In South Africa. I've never heard of that alliance once in my entire life. And all of a sudden, you know, you're talking about China's inventing a digital currency. China is now, you know, contemplating selling or buying oil in renminbi in Saudi Arabia. This is a huge deal, Cyrus. We, we, we are completely blocked from this in America society. We hear nothing about this. And I say, I said, yeah, I, I just, I, I'm trying to bring a little bit more objectivity here. And I said, look, you know, I, I, I will talk about the negative. I will talk about the positive. I'm trying. I'm not trying to say China's government's a, you know perfect or China's this utopia society, uh, but it's it's you know. And, and I just said, look at all the, like you just said, Alex. Look at all the Dow companies that are coming here that are investing. Uh, a couple of days ago, Christmas Eve, I played golf with um, a couple of guys here in Las Vegas, and it was amazing. One of the guys he owns an LED company, so he, he his his company makes all of the signs that you see on the Las Vegas Strip. All of these 3D signs, LED screens. I met with, I play with him, and I met with another, play with another guy who owns a Hollywood, it's basically a studio here in Las Vegas. And he, you know, it's incredible because both of them, they said, our entire business is based on China. I mean, like we, we could not function without China. All of the LED screens that are seen on the Las Vegas Strip, I've been doing this for 25 years. All of them come from China amazing quality, amazing price points. I work, I've had so many people come for over the last 25 years, come from China, come here, you know, come to America. How do we do more business? How do we do this? I mean, it's it, my, my relationship with China is incredible. You know, the other guy that has these, you know, he's built this amazing studio where he films all of these commercials, you know, from the NFL to Audi to all of this. He's like, look, all of our tech is from China. Like we just, we just simply don't have the manufacturing capability inside this country we are just so we so need a relationship with China, and 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 th so this is where I want people to understand. You know, when when you talk to successful people inside the United States of America, you talk to people that really understand how it works. I mean, Alex, you're an experienced stock market trader. I mean, you 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 have lived around the world. You get it, right? You you're successful. You understand how this world economy works. You've been an expat for many years. When you talk to people that understand the global economy, everybody understands China's role, right? The people that hate China the most are people that are very ignorant. And, and this is unfortunately what people like where, like Fox, Fox News. This is their target market. People that have not traveled, people that are largely ignorant, and that people that we can basically manipulate. And this is this is where the media is in this in this in this country, is that they can manipulate and they say. I mean, the, the stuff that they spew, I mean, and this is the problem. You get a guy like Gordon Chang who goes on and spews mm. all of this nonsense. And this is why people have a negative 
uh, impression. But this is also where there's great opportunity because, Alex, you know, we're going to start something new in the new year. Why don't you tell everybody about it? But we're going to start, you know, this is why, you know, our YouTube channels continue to grow and why we have a, a dedicated fan base of fans all over the world. I mean, guys, we've been well over a thousand people in the stream, people tuning in from all corners of the globe. I really appreciate you spending your time because time is our most valuable asset. And when you give me the time, I, 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 I it's, it's a big responsibility. So I want to make sure I deliver that quality content. Alex understands that every week delivering quality content. Alex, tell everybody, what are we doing in the new year? So it looks like about uh, January 15th, we'll be relaunching the Let's Talk China show here to the audience. And we have a lot in store. Of course, Cyrus and myself will be mainstays on that program, as well as uh, we'll be bringing in Daniel Dumbrell. It looks like for the first weekend and also uh, another appearance from another major channel on YouTube. Now, we have had many discussions about this program probably over the last six months, Cyrus and I, yeah. and we have agreed that it's going to be pretty high caliber. The um, guests, sorry, my microphone just about fell there. The guests that we're going to be bringing on this program are going to, you know, really change the landscape on what Let's Talk China was before and what it's going to be in the future. We're going to really, I think, uh, bring it up to a level where it never has been. Uh, we are going to be launching it in the new studio here in Chongqing. We've been working on that studio for about four months now. You're going to see a much more professional show. It's not going to be uh, like it was before. And I think, Cyrus, I'm going to pass it to you to maybe describe where, where we're going with the modeling of the show. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want guys, first of all, I want to give Alex a big uh, thank you and a shout out because I'm going to I'm going to rewind this the clocks back to around June 2020. Um, I had a YouTube channel of about two, three thousand people. I was just starting my YouTube journey. And Alex, you know, had reached out to me and said, Hey, man, would you like to join, you know, the YouTube, you know, our, our program called Let's Talk China. And, you know, at the time we had, you know, the Barretts, uh, Guaylo, Matt from Jayo Nation, Alex, myself, you know, there was always about five of us that would go on this show. We had a couple months there. And, and I remember like my first appearance, you know, I gained probably about a thousand subscribers in the next coming days. So I mean, like, you know, I went from 3000 to 4000 subscribers. It was, a, it was a big deal, you know, for me at the time, you know, and it was because of appearance on this show. So Alex, thanks for, you know, always, uh, you know, uh, believing in me and supporting me from day one. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. And, <laughs> and I think, I, th I think what it was is, you know, it's, it's kind of like, let's talk China, you know, that, that was the concept of it. And it was mm -hmm. at the time it was a bit more casual. And I, I mean, we liked those shows because it was five guys, you know, kind of sharing ideas, kind of sharing like what's going on. And I think what we want to do now is we want to take it to the next level where you're going to see what's what's important and what's needed is we want to have a consistent product, you know, something where it's like, OK, every week at, you know, every, let's just say Fridays at 5 p.m. You know, we haven't we don't know the exact time yet. Let's just say that for an example. Fridays at 5 p.m. every week, we're going to have a new show and it's going to be something consistent that you can mark on your calendar. You know, it's going to be a quality show. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring in you know, very, you know, Alex and I, all of us, we're going to try to bring in very high quality guests. So we want to bring in, you know, and, and just we want to really want to, again, it's just providing good content for you guys to enjoy. And I think Alex, uh, I mean, you know, him and I both, we, we all know we have a big responsibility here because, you know, there needs to be more um, objective reporting about China. There needs to be um, you know, more people that are speaking out for a positive relationship. Again, I, I don't like the label that I'm pro-China. I think I'm I'm very much pro-engagement. I'm no more pro-China than I am pro-America. I mean, I love, I love both countries. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that I love China. There's nothing wrong with saying that I want a good relationship with the U.S. and China. That's my stance. Um, you know, I want, I want the U.S. to succeed. Obviously, it's my home country. It's the country I live in with my family. I want America, I want China to succeed as well. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it, like Alex had said, you know, there's people that want China to fail desperately. People don't really understand that. If China fails, if China go, is a catastrophe, that's, that, that means our economy in America is going to get hammered too. It's, it's a, it is a two-way two street. So again, we're going to be bringing in high-profile guests that are going to be really adding a lot to this. I'm talking, you know, authors uh, of, of China books, people that have, uh, you know, academia, professors, people that have had really good experience and that could really 
you know, very credible people, you know, that are, that have really, that you want to hear from, you know, that you really want to hear these insights from. So we got a lot of guests in the pipeline. And again, it's, you're going to be seeing um, Alex, he has worked with, um, you know, really, really producing from the production side. I can say that we've been working on this for well over six mm. months now, well over six months, really yeah. preparing for this, but it's at a point now where we're very, uh, we're very excited that we're going to launch it. So Look for this January 14th, 15th, uh, depending on your time zone. We'll be announcing this in the next couple of weeks. But I wanted to bring Alex in to, one, tell us more about the stream. Uh, sorry, sorry. Tell us more about the situation in Chongqing as someone living on the ground. And number two, we're going to uh, kind of end today's stream with this big announcement that we're going to take 2023, guys. We're going to take it to the next level. So uh, look forward to that. Yeah, and, and thank you for that, Cyrus. I, I think also that what I want to add about that show is that we're going to be, you know, I would say stating facts and uh, less of um, what other shows are out there that really um, get personal. This one is going to be pretty much based on, you know, bringing, um, the, like you said before, the guests here, professors, and even a couple of um Hear me out on this one. A few politicians have actually uh, reached out to me that would like to come on the program as well to, uh, you know, either enter into a debate or as well to also speak about uh, maybe their concerns as well. And I think it's important that we are open minded to engaging with these types of conversations. And I mean, you're well versed in handling those types of situations as well. So it's going to be quite, quite fun, to be honest. Yeah, I think it will be. Um, it's going to be great. Guys, I want to say thank you all for spending time with us. I, I hope everybody had a very uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, thank you for joining me. Today is my birthday, same as Chairman Mao. So, um, you know, fun <laughs> little tidbit there. But thank you for joining me on my birthday. It's it's fun to spend time with, you know, a couple thousand people that have joined the the, uh, the program here today. And again, we're going to have a lot of exciting things happening in 2023. Uh, I'm optimistic. I think it's going to be our best year on YouTube yet in 2023. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody uh, for supporting, you know, this channel. Um, you know, this channel has uh, grown the, the best it's grown. You know, 2022 is the best year I've had on YouTube. Uh, you know, we've really taken it to the next level. And I'm, I'm really excited. Um, I, I, I was doing some statistics on this. So in 2020, my channel had uh, 4 million views. Uh, in 2021, it had 8 million views, so it doubled. And then last year in 2022, or through this year, uh, we've gotten 16 million views. So we've had, you know, two consecutive years of doubling, um, you know, on the views here and subscriber growth. So, you know, we're continuing to get the message out. Um, we, we've had, um, you know, seven of the top 10 most viewed videos on this channel have been produced in 2022. So there's some really nice statistics that I want to say thank you guys. Thank you for supporting this channel. Thanks for supporting Alex. Um, you know, uh, I know many of you want to hear from Daniel Dumrill as well. He, I know I'm excited to have him on the show. And, and you know, we're, we're going to have a lot of, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to bring a lot of objectivity and truth and analysis. And again, uh, I think it's just fighting for what we need to see in this world. And that is just engagement. Uh, again, I think uh, engagement is the key thing that we need here. Everybody, I'm going to sign off there. And uh, Alex, thank you so much for um, You're welcome from joining me tonight from live in Chongqing. Cheers. We'll see you in a couple of weeks, my friend. Yeah, sounds good. Happy All birthday. Right. Take care. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I'm going to end it with um, this. Uh, I'm going to end it with our with our classic little uh, show ending here. Alex, thanks for these awesome drone shots. Everyone, Pleasure. we'll see you in a new video soon.